Welcome to another episode of View from the Gallagher. I'm your host, Ian Smith, the Newcastle United season ticket holder in the Gallagher end, of course. And this week, I'm joined by Gordon and a very special guest, Paul from Magpie 24-7. Paul, how are you? Absolutely over the moon after the uh, events of uh, this afternoon. So delighted to be on the channel. Obviously, a long time watcher. So more than pleased to be on the channel. Thank you. Yeah, th- yeah, appreciate you being here. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll get into the Champions League draw really soon. Uh, Gordon, how are you getting on? Yeah, just the same. I'm absolutely um, thrilled. It couldn't couldn't be much uh, better that draw. Really, three big big teams coming to St James's. I mean, just it's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's only one place to begin today, really, uh, and that is the Champions League draw, where Newcastle finally found out their opponents for the group stage. Is something we've been waiting for since May when we qualified, and what a group it is! Newcastle are in Group F, the Group of Death. I think it's fair we can call it that. And we're going to face. Did, did, you, did you hear the gasp around the auditorium when the yeah, yeah. when uh, Newcastle United were, were mentioned at the end? Everybody knows it's the Group of Death. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, and the, these three teams, Paris Saint Germain, Borussia Dortmund, and AC Milan, none of them will have fancied taking us out of pot four, but that's what we've got, that's what they've got. And it's our first campaign in the competition for 20 years. What a welcome back to the world's <laughs> Premier Cup competition. And I mean, how, how are we feeling about the draw then, Paul? Start us off. I was absolutely over the moon. I think if you're going to have waited two decades to get back into the competition, this is exactly the sort of draw that you want. With the greatest of respect to some of the other groups, um, when I saw that one, it was like, yeah, it's written in the stars. You knew as soon as Milan sort of came out, I was like, that that is going to be us. That's got to be us. Uh, but yeah, absolutely uh, delighted. It brings back, of course, great memories of previous campaigns when we probably felt the same sort of butterflies we're all feeling at the moment. But uh, yeah, an absolutely amazing draw for me. And there's so many of those little hidden subplots behind a lot of the games yeah. as well. You know, the connection with Isaac and uh, Dortmund, uh, the connections between Tenali or Tunali uh, and mm-hmm. you know, Castle United and, and Milan, obviously. So there's lots of those little caveats that I love. Uh, just simmering away there behind, and uh, I can't wait under the lights, St James's Park, uh, and already started, you know, trying to think about plans for uh, trips to you know, France to, yeah. uh, and, and oh, to Germany. You're, making, the you're, you're, you're already making me so excited just talking <laughs> about it. Like I feel exactly the same. There's so much in this draw, and like as, as the draw was going on, I was kind of like I was on Twitter and lots of people tweeting about it, and and honestly, it was like people were wanting oh Group E and which is Feyenoord and Atletico's group, which would have been a great group. But really, they wanted that because they felt like that was a simpler group. But really, I, I when I saw Group F, once Milan landed in Group F... Yeah, that was, was the moment for me. I was like, I want that group. I, I want that yeah. group, and we and we got it. Uh, Gordon, how do you feel about it? Yeah, just as excited as you two lads. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the first cup back in 68-69, um, and the teams we drove then, you know, were, were like top of the notch uh, European sides, a different format clearly, but Feyenoord, Sporting Lisbon, Wiesch Pestosa, who were a big side then. Um, So this is really exciting. And the fact is we've never played any of these in Europe. So I think that in itself is just wonderful because we could have got Barcelona or uh, Inter Milan or whatever, but actually having three teams we've not played and the size of these teams and their reputation um, is just it's mouth watering. It really is. It what really you don't is. want is, is um, I'm away the week the beginning the 16th of September um, for a week. we and we're actually in the Italian lake. Now I'm hoping that we play AC <laughs> Milan that week in Milan. But sod's law will be that we'll be playing them at St James's Park instead, and I'll be over in Italy and I'll miss it. But you know, yeah. there we go. You can guarantee that's going to happen. You're going to have Milan oh, and yes. Newcastle, and you're going to be over there. But um, well, let's 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 go for it. I mean, it's a hard one this because they're all the three amazing teams. Which game are you most looking forward to watching? Um, you know, whether that's home or away. I mean, Paul, it sounds like you're. Are you trying to get a, go to at least one of these games away? Yeah, definitely. Myself and Kyle, obviously the other lad who, who runs Magpie twenty four seven. We were straight on, straight on there. We got the group chat, and we were straight saying, you know, which game will be easiest to get to? What are the different options? Um, and it's just so exciting. It, it's it's what I've been harping on about 
for so, so long. I miss these European adventures and stuff. And um, I'm just over the moon. Like I said, the romantic side of me wanted possibly Barcelona because of the history. You know, the Adaspria videos even put up by the social media team for Newcastle recently. But um, yeah, I mean, I think any of these away games that we can get to, I've even said, said to Kyle, look, even if we can't get tickets, just to be there, to sample it, uh, to take it all in, um, got got to be there. But clearly yeah. the Milan one, you know, same same venue, obviously different opposition, but yeah. the thought of several thousand Geordies, a special night, the Tenali, that subplot I was on about uh, before, that would yeah, be absolutely I, I, fantastic. I think, I, think the Milan, I, I think the Milan one sticks out for me as well for a few reasons. Obviously, the, the Tenali story is a great one, obviously just signing him from Milan this summer. But I think, I mean, uh, we were lucky enough to actually be in Milan 20 years ago when we played Inter and Shearer scored twice. And I, I maintain that that experience in Milan is my absolute highlight of being a Newcastle supporter. I've never mm. experienced anything like it. It was just brilliant. We had a great few days in Milan. The game was great. We should have won probably, but we drew and it, we saw Shearer score twice yeah. and it was brilliant. So, yeah. so to go back to the San Siro, uh, yeah, different opposition, but still to go to return to Milan to actually to return to Milan and play a different team is actually quite nice, I think, because like mm. you were saying, Gordon, like it's good to play different teams. We're now going to have yeah. on our list of teams that we've played. We're going to add Milan, Dortmund, and Paris. Well, and don't, that's don't don't worry, amazing. don't worry about Inter Milan. We'll face them in the knockout stages. <laughs> yeah. back. We'll go back. Confidence. We'll be back. We'll be back. Yeah, yeah. I like <laughs> it. Um, so I think Milan away for me is a. Uh, I mean, I won't be able to get there this any of the away games this time just because my my job just does not allow me to to get to midweek games away from home in Europe. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the home game, I think any of them are going to be great. But I mean, let's be honest, we're going to have Mbappe coming to St James's Park. That's that's pretty cool. Well, that's pretty cool. I must admit, have you seen the, the the clip when he was playing football manager and he was on about Newcastle before and about the weather? I've uh, just I know, seen I know, it, his Carl was straight on that on on on, on Twitter about yeah, it. Yeah, just um, saw it Again, it's another one of those little, just like I say, little subplots, little uh, extra little bits that you can sort of throw in. Uh, mm. you're, you're right, seeing those sort of players uh, at St James's Park, and and let's get get it straight. None of those teams that we pulled out of that uh, hat today or ball or whatever, um, <laughs> none of them will was... fancy a trip. None of them will fancy a trip to Tyneside under the lights with the atmosphere, the noise, the passion. And it's a little bit going into the unknown. We don't know how we'll react as a club and a team and a unit to playing different styles of opposition. Um, but I, I think I think we can make a decent fist of it. I really do. Yeah. I, I cannot wait. I cannot wait for these games to come around. Yeah. I, I agree with that last point, Paul. I think I think we can make a decent fist of it. And if you remember, I mean, when Barcelona arrived in '97, you know, I mean, but there was a bit of trepidation around. But you know, the, that atmosphere and that what happened in that game was is obviously it's a legendary, isn't it? And it's there's nothing to stop us yeah. creating our new new legend. Yeah, um, and I think... totally. Yeah, because it's, it's not just that. But the thing is, we weren't fancied in those games, and the crowd played such an important role. In mm. helping get those results, even the ones against uh, it was a Kiev and stuff like that, we were not we were not fancied at all. Yeah. And the Juventus game, you know, the crowd, the situation, and it, it you, you just never ever know. They won't have experienced anything like St James's Park, so bring them to our backyard, and that's got to be the basis and the foundation yeah. upon a successful Champions League campaign. Dortmund will be interesting in terms of atmosphere, though. In terms of like the world of experience, oh, yeah. anything quite like St James's Park, because I think Dortmund's atmosphere is pretty legendary, isn't it? So that's going to be an interesting one to see how our players it, be the battle, react going it? into <laughs> going flags. into that kind of environment that's against them. Yeah, it's going to be something else, isn't it? I think uh, mm. all these, all six games will be memorable in their own way. Um, and you know, if we can, if we can get out of this group, wow, that would be just. Uh, incredible, absolutely incredible. When? Uh, and which, which game? Are, which game are you looking forward to the most, Gordon? Um, which one? If you, was to, if you had to pick one I of think, the six games, I think a bit like um, at you with with um, PSG coming to St James's. I think that's that's got a you know this huge ring of this very wealthy club um, uh, owned by the, the other the other um, subplot there is yeah. the Qatari Saudi rivalry, Qatari. isn't it? 
Exactly. Oil classic oil. Yeah. Exactly. Oil classic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's going to be a great night. Like I say, I'm just hoping, yeah. really, really hoping that the first game is away somewhere because I don't, I'm, I'll miss it if, if it's a home game. But uh, yeah, yeah. and I'll be, I'll be, I'll be a little bit um, sad if I'm not able to get to it. But no, I, I think PSG will be will be memorable. But as I say, I think they'll all be great nights. Yeah, uh, Paul. So do, do you reckon we can actually get out of the group? Do you think we will get out of this group of death? <laughs> I, I do, I do. I mean, at first, it, your first when when it's pulled out, and you're, you're looking at the names on the screen. You're a little bit, yeah. You know, this is typical Newcastle United. If we're going to do it, we do it. You know, the the difficult way. But I just feel uh, we will be a little bit of the unknown for them. Um, they've got to come over here, and they've got a lot of great players, no doubt about it. Um, but the atmosphere, that link, the the crowd is going to play such a huge role. You saw the, yeah. uh, especially first half against Liverpool, how much uh, that it can affect the game, and we'll need that for the entire ninety minutes. They're going to have to give out, uh, you know, top top performances. Um, yeah. But yeah, I definitely think if we can get the victories at home, yeah. again, you're going against the likes of Dortmund. They've lost one or two. AC Milan, they've lost arguably their best player in Sandro Tonali to Newcastle United. Um, so it, it gives us a chance. It gives us a, a, a possibility. Uh, and again, you know, like with this takeover, like what we've always said, we've got hope. We do have hope, uh, uh, you know, and as long as we've got that hope, uh, then we'll give the lads a thousand percent uh, back yeah. in and the team will give everything. I've no doubt about that. They'll leave every little last inch, sweat, yeah. blood, tears, everything will be left on the park. So I, I am confident uh, but it's yeah. just so great to be playing the likes of Paris Saint Germain instead of the likes of Preston that our knee and neighbours are playing. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. what, the thing is, I think um, there's a couple of things really. I mean, the main one being, I think obviously we are the underdogs. We're in pot four, but we were in pot four really because of our we haven't been in Europe for such a long time. Jeez, not actually. because of <laughs> not because of how good we actually are. And I was thinking, Man United are in pot two now. Obviously, they're they're a good a good team, but like we were pretty neck and neck with them last season. Really, they got the better of us in the league and the and the cup, but only by a little thin narrow margins. And you could you could almost argue we were actually a better team in some respects. But like so, so the pot four thing's a bit of a, in my opinion, is a bit of a sort of red herring. And I think we are better than. I think we even realise we are when you compare us to other leagues in Europe. The the English league's so strong. The fact that we are, you know, in the top four or five teams in our league automatically puts us ahead of lots of even teams in the Champions League. Now I'm not saying that we're gonna beat all these teams in this in this um group, but you know, the bookies have got us as bigger favourites to win the entire competition than Dortmund and Milan. And I don't think that's... A, that's there's, a, there's something in we? that, you know? I think we ate favourites to win the, the entire thing. You know, yeah, which is yeah. bonkers. I mean, it's, it's crazy, bonkers. isn't it? But the point is, the, the English league is so strong that we are... I think we're stronger than we sort of realise, in a sense. Yeah. We, we can it's, definitely it's right. give these teams a game. If, if you look and at the also, teams... Like, you know, some of these teams, are, they're, they're in, like you said, Paul, about um, Tonali coming to us, they're in the throes of rebuilding as well, aren't they? And I think Dortmund are. They're not Dortmund, aren't the Dortmund of they're two or three years. Um, so I think, you know. Well, I mean, we're, Dortmund, we're, Dortmund nearly won, the, Dortmund should have won the Bundesliga last season. They yeah. they mm-hmm. threw it away on the last day. In I mean, you think yeah, think of yeah, the agony true. we had against Liverpool mm-hmm. uh, on Sunday, which we'll come on to in a few minutes. But, um, Dortmund threw away the league title in yes, agonising fashion true. at the end of last season. Yeah. So they were, but I'm I'm not 100 percent sure who they've lost over the summer. I, ha- I did read somewhere that they they are sort of in a bit of a rebuild. So well, I think they might have lost a couple of players, and yeah. that that was significant to them. Um, but I just think we just got to embrace it and go with it and just enjoy totally. it. I think it'll be great. It'll be fantastic. Totally, totally. it's very very exciting, and uh, I'm. I'm excited about the whole thing. I cannot wait for that first night 
at St. James's Park, whoever it's against, yeah. that is going to be one for the ages, I think. And War Flags are already asking for donations, aren't they, for something special. So, you know, if you can afford to do that and stretch and support War Flags, then do it because I think it'll be very, very worthwhile. Let's move on then because um, the Champions League wasn't the only cup draw that Newcastle United had this week. So on Wednesday evening, we found out that um, entering the third round of the Carabao Cup didn't actually do us any favours <laughs> because not only were we paired with three great teams in Europe tonight, we were also paired with the European champions in the Carabao Cup for a home tie against Man City. Gordon, what do you think of this draw? <laughs> I have to say, I laughed. I was watching it. Um, I was in bed. I had my headphones on. And then it got to the last, and I knew we, there were four balls left. And then we came in. I said, oh, get in. That's good. And then <laughs> then it came Man City, and I said, you've got to be joking. So I, I yelled. I shouted that. Of course, I had headphones on, so <laughs> your mom couldn't hear it until anything until I, I made that comment. She said, what's happened? You know, and, and it... <sighs> Look, we're at home to Man City, not away. So let's see. We, we, can, we can give them a game at, at Newcastle. Yeah. I've no doubt. Paul? Yeah, I mean, the first thing, obviously, as soon as the Man City um, you know, tie was confirmed, I'm sitting there thinking, well, we have we have form for dumping them out of the third round of the League Cup. Uh, and I was sort of scratching my head sitting there thinking, oh, it was uh, Rolando Ahrens, wasn't it? That's and right. uh, Sissoko. Uh, That's right. You know, in that, that famous victory down there. Now, it was very much a second uh, string side when we were down there. So you can just never say never. But I think if our if the game had been down at the Etihad, I, I would have be feeling quite pessimistic about it. But the mm. chance and the fact that it's at St James's Park, there's going to be a great crowd in there because tickets are absolutely scarce as. So there's going to be a good atmosphere. Yeah. There'll be a large crowd. Uh, Pat Guerrero. <laughs> Pep Guardiola has already uh, talked about coming to St. James's Park before, and now it's such a difficult, tall order to do. They're going to rotate, you would hope, a couple. Eddie Howe will most likely go strong because, you know, taste of it last season. And if you're going to win the thing, you've got to beat the best at some point. So yeah. might as well start as we mean to go on. Uh, I agree probably, with that know... point, Paul, about mm. um, I think it'll all depend on their team selection, really. Now, yeah. obviously, we know Man, United, uh, Man City's strength in depth is is insanely strong. So whatever team they put out will be hard to beat. Be a great one. But it's not beyond the realms of possibility at St. James's Park, under the lights, that we could we could turn them over. I don't think that's yeah, ridiculous so, I mean, to say. Southampton, Southampton last uh, season, did they expect to knock Man City out? They didn't, did they? And yeah. uh, they turned up and they did a, 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 like a number on them yeah. and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, knocked them out of the, uh, knocked them out of the cup. So th there's every, po you know, every possibility because the players know that they've got a taste for it last season, getting through to the final. They'll want to get back to the final. Uh, so it's, again, it's all about these extra few percentage points that we can get out of the players, mm -hmm. that little extra little bit of effort, great determination uh, that might just be enough. I mean, you know, we drew with them three apiece, didn't we? Uh, and we were three one up yeah. at one point in that game. So we can get around them. We can get about them. And I think at St. James's Park, there definitely is the possibility um, of, of beating them and dumping them out of yeah. the cup. But think, it's going to be a difficult game. It's great respect to them. I think our chances increase significantly with the fact it's a home game. I think that, that makes a big difference for us. It, it makes a, 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 a ridiculously tricky tie oh. slightly less tricky. Obviously, we take nothing for granted, but I think being at home helps us a little bit. So it's exciting. Um, there was one little issue with this draw, which I'm sure you've picked up on. The ball order was wrong. So apparently Newcastle should have been ball 19 instead of ball 20. Yeah, it's somebody doesn't know the few... alphabet. Yyeah, because Norwich were put uh, <laughs> alphabetically ahead of us. Well, you know, when, yeah. when Norwich came out, I'm thinking, all right, how can they have been ball 19 and we're 20? Because I knew we were 20 uh, because we've been told beforehand. But when Norwich mm. came out, I'm thinking, hmm. I think they've yeah. got that wrong. <laughs> well, well, the league, the FA have have said today, but they have admitted it was wrong, and um, that it was wrong. But there's there's also no rule that says that everything needs to be in alphabetical order. And, yeah. and I guess if you look at the last few numbers in the draw anyway, because the last few um, ties were played Wednesday night, and those teams filled those numbers, so there was no yeah. rule there. So 
I'm not bothered about this really. I just yeah. thought it was an interesting point, but some some fans were sort of calling for you know the draw to be redone and stuff. But I, personally, I just think, look, we got Man City and we just get on with it. Craftsman at straws, isn't it? The thing is for the Man yeah. City game now is we're going to have a Champions League game on the Wednesday before or the Tuesday before. We've then got a league game on the on the that weekend. Then we got Man City in the Carabao Cup. Then. A league game, then another Champions League game. I mean, it's just, it's just bewildered. It's just mind blown, isn't it? I mean, yeah, but this is why, this is why, this is when the rotation starts, isn't it? This is when Eddie right. Howe starts using the squad more, and I think that's what mm-hmm. we'll see after the international break. Is Eddie Howe making changes game after game? So, uh, one other thing you've just mentioned there about the Champions League um, thing, Dad, it just reminded me. We'll find out the actual fixtures. UEFA themselves said no later than Saturday. So all the fixtures should be published either Friday or Saturday. So if you're listening to this podcast, you, it might already have been done um, by Saturday. So yeah, um, so that's worth worth knowing as well. Let's move on then. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll change the tone a little bit. So Sunday feels like it was a long time ago in some respects, but let's have a little chat about Newcastle's loss at home to Liverpool. Uh, we all know, taking the lead through Anthony Gordon, uh, the Magpies saw their opponents reduced to 10 men as Virgil van Dijk was red carded for a foul on Isak after 20 minutes. And it seemed that Newcastle were in a prime position to get their first win over Liverpool since the 2015-16 season. But a Darwin Nunes inspired Liverpool had other ideas by scoring two late goals. Newcastle succumbed to a truly devastating 2 1 loss, which was very, very difficult for anyone connected with Newcastle to stomach, myself included. Gordon, Dad, you were sat next to me. We could <laughs> barely speak, could we? Where does this one sit in the all time pain rankings of a defeat by Liverpool? It was one of the worst, I have to say. <laughs> I felt totally bereft after that game finished. And I mean the, the worst the worst one was still the four three down at Anfield. That that went to Colin Mosco because that was just that was just awful. But this yeah. really ranks alongside it. Um and it, it it it's just frustrating because actually for most of that game we were actually the better team. And I think what's frustrating is I think we got caught between two too stool. We, we we didn't know whether to stick or twist and we stopped being what we are in the second half, I thought. I mean, I know that's made of the substitutions and I guess they did influence the game. But, you know, the two weeks before against Villa, we brought on the same subs and they, they changed the game. They, they, they made us go on and win the game even more handsomely than, than before. But I guess with a 1-0 lead, we got nervous and let's face it, Liverpool's strength is their attacking strength. Uh, and the pace, mm. um, and they got lucky. I mean, the ball bouncing off Botman's back, hitting his heel, and he plays a perfect through ball to Nunes. I mean, it's just it's beyond belief. Also, and then, also and then, the fact we, that Nunes Nunes suddenly decided to be a hundred million pound striker or whatever yeah. it is for the first time in eighteen months <laughs> didn't help either. I mean, his finishes were were brilliant. To be fair to him, but yeah. on and another that, day, that on the other day, he doesn't score them. Well, of course he doesn't. Or Pope gets a hand to it, you know. And he, yeah. But the thing is, at that point, I just so sat there thinking, just take the one-one. You know, as painful as that would be, just don't lose it to these lots. That's what we were saying. Course, That's what we were saying in the stadium. We're, we're in the strawberry corner, um, in well, the no, strawberry corner in the East Sand. So mm. we're not, we're not, uh, we're not too far away from you. Um, and we, we were just saying, look, no, just Are literally you... a, a couple across. Couple across right. from that, right at the front, and and to be honest, after after the first goal get went in, I was I was doing my classic Keegan impression. I was over the Hordens, feeling absolutely sick as a dog. <laughs> when the second mm. one went in, I had somebody who came down the steps, kicked the actual advertising horn clean off as I was right next mm. to it. The frustration mm. inside the stadium was absolutely bubbling. But Klopp did a number as as much as I do. I cannot stand the man. I used to think he was quite refreshing. I now think he's a bit of an arrogant prat, to be honest. Um, yeah. You know, he did do a number uh, over Eddie Howard, has to be said. Uh, I thought mm-hmm. first half, we were m- very much um, good value. 
It's the old adage, if you don't take your chances, it will come to bite you on the backside. And that's what it uh, did. I thought mm-hmm. that Liverpool's tactics were basically, from the moment the red card came, was just to frustrate the game, get to the last 10, 15 minutes. And then they had the substitutes to bring on the attacking players. Yeah. I mean, they didn't really yeah. play with a striker during the beginning of the game. Get to the last yeah. uh, bit of the game and try and get a draw out of it. Try to nick a, a point out of the game. Uh, and bringing on somebody like Nunes, 10, 15 minutes to go, was a bit of a master stroke. He's fresh, he's uh, eager, he's hungry. It's a noisy atmosphere, and he comes on and he rubs uh, salt into the wounds. And it's just, mm. it has to be Klopp again. It's like anybody else but Turkey Teeth. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's I what think, I was saying. And yeah. I, I was like, I was just literally, I cannot remember. And I sat there as we've lost against the likes of Bournemouth and Steve McLaren's been there and boos ringing around. I was absolutely, it was just gutted. There wasn't any really like booing or anything. Uh, you could hear the Liverpool fans for the first time, but I was just so, so gutted. I felt like the oxygen had just been ripped out yeah. from inside of me. There was a real was sense of, it was a, it was like a stunned silence in the, in the Newcastle end, pretty much. It was, it's rare that that happens, like where you, You've, we lose games, or you, you know, but it didn't feel like that. It, 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 thankfully, these types of things don't happen that often. But when they do, they really, they're just freakish events, and they, as a fan, to be on the wrong end of, they're just horrible. And there is an issue. I think it will make it worse. A... Sorry, Ian. Yeah, go on. It's all right. I was just going to say the thing. The thing with Liverpool, I just wonder. There just seems to be something against Liverpool that we need to get over. And the the longer that we don't win, especially with Eddie Howe as manager, um, now that he's been beaten three times in a row or whatever it is by more than three times, isn't it? Four times, whatever. Like the longer that now goes on, the bigger an issue it becomes every time we play them. And it's something that we have to break at some point. We have to get over mm-hmm. this thing with Liverpool and I and and I don't know if it is slightly psychological. I do agree with you, Gordon, that we changed the way we played. We didn't play the fast paced pressing that we normally do. And we, we tried to do what Man City did to us, which was get what get a one nil lead and, and basically try and pass our way around for to see the game out. But we're not that team. It's no. the old idea. And we're not yeah, if you don't take those chances, because even whilst we were playing slightly more tepid in the second half within ourselves, we still had the opportunities. That's the frustrating thing about it. You know, yeah. we had the chances, the great save by their keeper, the hit in the post. We had the chances. And this is the fine margins that, we're, you know, that, that we're talking about. Um, yeah, I think there was two in, incidents in the, in the second half that, that summed it up for me was one when we had a fantastic team move and we created a really good chance and Almiron was in space on in about you know 10 yards out and he blazed it over the bar and he could have taken a touch and then hammered it in. Mm. And that was one. And the other thing was when Harvey Barnes came on, he looked like uh, he was frightened. He looked like an imitation of the player I had seen two weeks before. He looked very you're hesitant. Right, you're right. Yeah, you were right to mention that because he, he came onto the ball and he had a great chance. He was away down on the left-hand side, corner of the box. And you look and there was Callum Wilson in the middle. Now, he could have took a shot on or he could have passed. And he sort of didn't do either. He was caught in yeah. two minds. Mm-hmm. He was he just didn't seem to be in his in his full, you know, flow. Yeah. And sort of, and... again, it was another opportunity that sort of was fluffed. And it is, again, about those small... You know, split yeah, second stuff, moments. You learn, you, know you learn I mean? from that stuff, don't you? Yeah, you, you should learn from that. But I agree. It's like against Villa, he was so um, precise in his decision making. He was, it was like, right, yeah, this this time I'm going to just whack it into the back of the net. This time I'm going to play it across and feed Callum Wilson. And obviously, Wilson missed the chance against Villa, but he kind of just didn't have that fluidity to his decision making against Liverpool for some reason. Let's just very quickly before we move on, just have a very quick chat about. Almiron in particular. Um, so he he had our three best chances. And I've been thinking about this because he's come for, under a lot of stick this week. And I don't know, some of it seems justified in my opinion, but some of it probably isn't justified. 
he had our three best chances. He had the one in the first half where Allison makes a ridiculous save. He hit the post, and then there was the other one that you've just mentioned where he, he was totally not skied composed it, and skied it. Should he have, should he be scoring one of them though? Yes, well, <laughs> he should. He should do, shouldn't he? Yeah, uh, to be fair to him, I think the one he should have scored was the one I've just described before. I think the one that the, Alisson makes a save from, he can't do any more than what he did. It was yeah. it was a brilliant save, absolutely brilliant save. And I thought it was in from where we were. And then, of course, you know, and, and the thing with Alisson, he made a save and then he made another save. He parried it away. The one that hit the outside the post, that's just one of them. It was in full flight. He went, he, he did. And what I think about Almiron, you know, is the less time he has to think about something, the better a finisher he is. And I think with the one that he had the space and the time, he 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 just gets it wrong, and he does that more often than not um, when he has the time. And if you look at some of his goals last season, they were a lot of the good ones. The goals he scored were instinctive, just instinct. first time ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one last thing: if we go if we go two nil up in that match at any point, we're winning that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's just a, a, a very harsh lesson in not taking your chances, mm-hmm. isn't it? Mm-hmm. I think. I think uh, so because is. I think if you go if you go two 0 up, uh, Klopp goes into thinking about the bigger picture and he's planning about future games and resting yeah. players and not risking players and that sort Definitely. of thing. But I will just caveat. I mean, the Mickey thing. It's so frustrating. I mean, uh, I love his enthusiasm. I love his passion. Uh, I think Eddie Howe puts him in because he gets through an amazing amount of work, you know, in the same way that a Sean Longstaff gets uh, a lot of good stuff off the ball. Um, but it's just like you say, it is. It's just his decision making, those split second decisions that sometimes he just doesn't need to think about. You're right. He just needs to just yeah. just do. And it's. Um, yeah. oh. Maybe an idea to get Jack Grealish to uh, criticise him again. He might go on another <laughs> yeah. absolute uh, barrage of uh, goals and great performances again. I think the thing is with, with Miggy, um, we, you know, he's been at the club quite a few years and he, he's, he's, he's got the work ethic and all the rest. But to be honest, within a year, two years, we're going to replace him because we're going to have somebody better than Miggy. As much as I love Miggy, you know, and his smile and all the rest of it. But if we want to get where we want to be to be a top team, we need a better, a higher level player. On I must that have right made, made, made me that. Think... The club put the club put some stuff out about um, obviously days gone by in the Champions League, and obviously mm. the Barcelona game has got replayed a thousand times. I, I probably played it a thousand times myself. And um, you see the Keith Gillespie run and the cross, and you hear the commentary. The cross coming in is a good. It's a good cross again, and you know Aspria absolutely plants it. And um, mm. you look at. Today's product, and it's all about cutting in and uh, taking extra touches. You just wish sometimes that you would get somebody to stretch the game, to get down uh, yeah. on the touchline and just knock some crosses in for the likes of, especially your, your Callum Wilsons. But I mean, Isaac is no no mug up there. But yeah. when you've got somebody like Callum Wilson, who, you know, bread and butter type stuff, get the crosses and just get them, get them whipped in. Like, you know, know they, they used to more often. Yeah, I know yeah. that Howe likes his wingers to cut in, doesn't he? That he likes mm. that because, you know, obviously Gordon on the left as well, kind of similar, um, who can cut in. But it would be nice because Gordon on the left can do both. So it'd be in time, it would be actually quite nice to have someone who could also go on the outside. Just one last thing to see on, on... If you look at Gordon on Sunday, he did, he did, he was the one that did his best work going outside the fullback. He, he was ripping them off every time. And if you look at his, the cross he made for uh, Tonali's goal against Villa, I mean, that was just a brilliant cross, wasn't it? Sensational it, it, cross. It, it's been a, a bit of a hallmark, though, last season. Uh, one of the real success uh, successful things about our style of play was that you'd have Joe Linton and Willick swapping, and in, you know, literally... Uh, one would be left, then he'd come central, and the mm-hmm. one would go out wide left. And it keeps the opposition guessing all the time. You know, you, you've yeah. got that flexibility. And I do sort of think that we have missed uh, Joe Willick uh, quite a bit, to be honest. Uh, I don't think he gets the uh, the write up that he, he deserves. But yeah, it's it's great to see all the lads literally just using it, you know, using the old noggin in the middle of the game and, you know, keep swapping around because, yeah. again, it can create uh, opportunities and. 
you know, mm-hmm. positions and it gives the opposition something else to be, you know, to be able to think about. Yeah. Um, let's just finish on this roundup of the Liverpool match on a positive. So let's talk about Anthony Gordon. Just, I really just wanted to say that obviously he was fantastic man of the match for me. He was, he was sensational while he was on the pitch. I also think the reason we lost was what was cause he went off. Now, I don't know whether how took him off because of fatigue or a, a knock or whatever it was. If I think when he went off, that allowed Trent to get into the game in a way that he wasn't before. And obviously Trent's pass for the... <laughs> Who said he so, shouldn't have even been on the pitch? <laughs> yeah, well, he shouldn't have been, but that's another story. But oh, then yes. if Gordon's on the pitch, Trent doesn't make that pass to Nunes for the winner. You know, it's, it's stuff like that, I think, that... You just in the course of a game, you don't know that's going to happen, obviously. But like Gordon's effect on the game was so strong, he was just brilliant. I, and I think he's he's had three solid games, more than solid games for us since he's arrived. And um, I just wanted to say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I, I think been, to be honest, yeah. He, he, well, I'd let you go there, Gordon. I'm just going to say, I think he's been one of our best player probably in, in, in probably all three games, really. He's been he's been excellent. I just think, and I'm really pleased for the lad because people were writing him off at the back end of last season, weren't they? He's not he's not up to it, he's not this. Then he had the England under 21 success, which he, he was he was he was superb for them, wasn't he, with what he did. Yeah. And then he started off the season really well and he, he deserves the accolades. And I do think taking him off, and Eddie Howe will probably know this, he'll reflect on it. And he'll think, oh, I did get it wrong. Uh, you know, he won't admit it, but I think he'll, he'll know. Yeah. Let's move on from the pain that was the defeat to Liverpool on Sunday, <laughs> though. We're going to flip it on its head. So this week, uh, we're going to... We like a bit of positivity on this show, basically. So <laughs> we love to take an alternative view on things. Uh, we enjoy building Newcastle up and spreading some much-needed joy and happiness. So we need to forget this Liverpool game. Um yeah, <laughs> and if that means look into the past to get some much needed light, light relief after a tough week, then we're definitely going to take that chance. So we're going to grab it with both hands and run with it. We're going to not dwell on the Liverpool game anymore. We're going to spend some time in this segment on our favourite ever Newcastle United late comebacks. So these are games, maybe last minute winners, but could be just comebacks in, in other ways. Um, it's pretty open, really. We've all had a bit of a think. I'm sure there'll be some crossover in memories and and games that we can talk about here. We've all had a think about it. We've all had a few, you know, we've all experienced some games that have ended positively for Newcastle, thankfully, over the years. Um, Who wants to kick us off? Paul, do you want to kick us off with with a a memory of a a comeback? Yeah, we'll we'll go quite a way back because there's quite a few times that Leicester, when I started thinking about games that stuck out in my mind, the Leicester, quite a few Leicester games. But if you go back to 1997, and a certain hat trick that took place in what 30 minutes. There's not going to be yeah. many that are going to uh, top that particular game. Um, you know, to be yeah. absolutely down, down and out. Shearer comes on, and I'm not having any of this. And it wasn't just the comeback and the last minute winner, you know, the Rob Lee goal across for Shearer and everything else. But it's like hat trick, Shearer, the god. Got himself. Yeah, uh, it was a wonderful fantastic. memory. That was that was on my list. It was one of the first ones that popped into my head. Actually, yeah, a Shearer hat trick, a last minute winner. I mean, that's like a a sweet combination that didn't happen very often, you know. Um, but yeah, thirteen minute a hat trick in the final thirty <laughs> minutes of a game. Yeah, you can keep your hands and Keynes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was yeah. probably on your list, was it? It, it was. I mean, I've got. Uh, it was one of the ones I wrote down. And interesting enough, and I'm, this isn't one of me the ones I want to talk about. There was another Leicester game at the beginning of the nineties. I don't know if you remember this, where we were actually three um, one down. Then we were. It, it was we won five four basically, and it was a game when um, Thingy Campbell scored for Leicester, and it was obviously the before Keegan. Um, that was a, a one that sprung to mind because um, that was quite memorable. But it's not one of the ones I've got on my list of me three me three favourites. What season yeah, was that? That, that, that was nineteen ninety one. All right, okay. So was it? Uh, it was it was five four. Very at the start of my attending matches. That one. Yeah, I, I think you were probably there, Ian, but you probably don't remember okay. much, as much as <laughs> I, I do. About it. That. that one didn't pop into my mind. So, um, I'm going to add one um, that I think is. 
relevant to today, um, with it being the Champions League draw when we're recording this podcast. And it's, you know, in a, it was a comeback in a comeback, in, in a sense, because not only did we come back in the match in question, we also came back in the group. So as you, as many of you will know, listening in 2003, we needed to win all three games to progress to the next round, 2002-2003 season, because we'd lost our first three games and we needed to win the last three. And um, we then played Feyenoord in Rotterdam and we were 1-0 up, actually. And then we went 2-1 down, 71 minutes, we were 2-1 down. And we were thinking, ah, we've, we've blown this, we've blown it. And I remember sitting watching this with you. Um, and then... Yeah, then sorry, no, it was two. They pulled it back to two, two. Sorry, and That's then we right. thought we'd blown we it because we were two nil up. We thought we'd blown it, um, two, two. And then the ninety-first minute, Craig Bellamy scores that. that he goal. had no right score on that goal, did he? Really? I mean, over the moon, he bloody did. Like, don't get me yeah. wrong, but he had no right from the angle that that he was. I mean, yeah. Newcastle United, typical. Again, we talked about it before. We don't do things the easy way, and on that night again, mm. we didn't do things. Um, the easy way, but I, I remember watching that game and literally everything I had, I think I had something on us, I, I, that got chucked, I picked the dog up, I was cuddling the dog, jumping around the living room, watching the game, absolutely mad, mad scenes, and this is what I mean, Any, anything anything can happen with Newcastle United in the Champions League. Yeah, that was, that was an amazing day, it was, the, I've written it down here, that, that was came to mind straight away, and the, actually, when it was... 2 0 on 2 1. I remember the commentary, I think it was John Champion was commentating on it, and he was saying, I'll oh, just be careful, Newcastle. And then they equalised, yeah. and it meant that we've dropped down into the Europa League or whatever it was then, or the UF, because it was, it was. And then, That's of course, sure, we were worried that, that Payne would win, win the game and we would be out of Europe altogether. Yeah. And of course, if the opposite happened, we actually we got the winner. It, it was unbelievable. And even now, unbelievable. I mean, I missed by Dyer, first of all, because he should have scored. And, of course, uh, Bellamy then, as you say, squeezing it in from an impossible angle. It was just... Yeah. Hugo was... Bayana, eh? Bayana, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, my never God. Quite bring, bring, it, bring it back memories there. Never I wish I had hair like, like a mate. <laughs> He did have <laughs> lo- lovely flowing locks, mm. didn't he? Mm. Uh, Gordon, give us, give us another one off your list. Who's that? Me? Did yeah, you say? Or Paul? Yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't. It, me. It's breaking up a little sorry. bit. The sound of things. Um, my my one was. Um, well, I've got a few. Feyenoord was on it, but um, Brighton away in the promotion season. Um, and we yeah. we were losing one nil. There were penalty, and it was live on on telly. Um, in fact, we played Brighton, and then we played Huddersfield. I think in successive games, and it was a big big end of the month. Um, and then the army. Scored the flukiest goal ever because it hit his foot and looped into the top corner. But then, Matt he meant, Ritchie, it, then, he meant that. He meant it, yeah, of course. <laughs> and <laughs> Matt Ritchie <laughs> then hit, hit 50, 60 yard pass um, from the, would you say, the right full back position to the left wing position. And I can't remember who got the ball, but he crossed it in and Perez came in on it and scored the winner. Um, he won 2-1 and that was in the last Shout. minute. Yeah, and that was, that was a, a great. absolutely incredible. And, and that was a big our, result. Well, our record against Brighton generally is terrible, isn't it, as well? So, mm. um, <laughs> so that, you know, it's good that we, we occasionally beat them. Um, yeah, good what one. Thing, That's a good that was shout. the last time we beat Brighton between... That result in the one in May, yeah, we hadn't beaten them ever since that game. That's right. So I think that's know. right. Uh, Paul, give us another one. I'm going to go for a Steve Bruce game. Go for <laughs> don't, it. Don't, I'm, don't don't judge me. Don't judge me, everybody. Uh, but right. you've, been enjoying, him. you've been enjoying his media appearances this week too much, Paul. Oh yes, one. oh yes. <laughs> I mean, he's no shame as he's got more neck than a giraffe. But uh, I went for the Everton uh, two Newcastle United two game. I was down at Woodison Woodison oh, Park, yeah. that is, uh, for this game. Now I watched ninety minutes of the purest dross that you will yeah. ever, ever, ever watch. I was sat there uh, down near the front and I got to the point I was chatting to the rest of the lads. I turned me back and I never do. I stayed till the end 
I don't leave early. I don't do anything. Like I turned me back and I just went, you know what? This has been the biggest shower that I've ever seen. And I'm sitting there on about the way back. Where are we going to stop for a drink and this sort of thing? Um, and I'm sitting there putting the world to rights. So we get the, obviously, the first goal by Lejeune. And you're just laughing your heads off. And Everton fans are giving it to us because obviously they went 2 0 up, didn't they? Um, so we get, we're trying to give a little bit back, trying to save a little bit of pace. And then two seconds later, you get the free <laughs> kick, and we're all like, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to score again, we're going to score again. And I'll tell you what, the noise. I mean, I'm I'm not the smallest, slimmest bloke, but I mean, I was bear hugged and threw into the air. I was much like uh, when I was with the dog before, bear hugged. The the arms and legs and limbs and all sorts was absolutely flying when that second goal went in. I couldn't have told you who'd scored the goal at the time because it was just absolutely uh, ridiculous. But for pure raw energy and yeah. emotion, a three minute, three minute, four minute spell. We're going out of Woodison Park. They are sort of feeling probably how we feel at the moment after the Liverpool game. Yeah. And I literally laughed the entire way from applauding the players after they came over, right the way back to the car with, with uh, Kyle yeah. and between the rest if, of the other lads. If you ever get a chance to listen to the... Look it up. Go and, look, go and find the commentary from BBC Radio Newcastle on that match because the commentary is great. But in the background, there's an Evertonian who is just screaming absolute dog's abuse at the team. It is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. It, honestly, go and find it. It, is, it cracks me up every single time. It's just You can just imagine this guy having a massive rant, you know, just like yeah. shouting, absolutely yeah. fuming. I think like... it's after the first goal scored. Um, <laughs> and it's just brilliant. I'm, goodness knows what it would have been like after the equaliser, but that's a great, a great game. That's a great it is. Game. Uh, game I, I, itself what's was terrible. hilarious? What's hilarious about the, I think it's the second goal, but uh, Jordan Pickford was actually behind the line trying to save the ball. And it was just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was he doing in the back of the net? I mean, he's, and he does that quite often. He finds himself behind the line. He, it's, it's but not then, a one but then afterwards, he's blaming everybody else. Well, what did you do? And what did you do? I'd have been turned around. If you hadn't have stood behind the bloody line, you idiot, then it wouldn't have been a goal. But it, it's, it's class, isn't it? When you see it back and the referee, you can see he's pointing to his watch yeah 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 okay good that's a good one i'm going to move on to another draw actually so not a win but probably one of the most famous premier league results of all time home to arsenal four nil down at half time and then the the comeback of all comebacks basically um this one mm -hmm. people's elbow on the list. pardon the people's elbow stephen harper wasn't it that's right. <laughs> doing his yeah, rock impression thing, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um you know, I mean, I remember being at the game, just we got torn apart in the first half. I mean, it was embarrassing. They were falling up after 26 minutes. And then it took a, it actually took a while for us to get back into the game in the second half. It was the 68th minute when we scored our first goal, um, Joey Barton. And then Leon Best, and then Barton, and then, of course, the famous long-range strike from Czech Teote. And the one thing, and it was amazing, to, the scenes in the stadium were unreal, but the one thing that is forgotten about that game really is we had a chance to win. We, yeah, we should have won honest. the game. But <laughs> yeah. what a what a game to be there for. That was that was a special one. Incredible. It was. Yeah. Um never, another one never, that, never, I, that I, another, another game that I, yeah. that I thought about was Leeds away in 2002 when Nobby Solano we, we came back from 3-1 down. Um, at Elland Road, and um, it, I mean, it didn't look likely. And Viduga, I think, scored twice for, for Leeds that day. And we were 3 1 down, and then turned it round. And Nobby Solano went through and scored the, the winning goal later on. And that, that was just that was just incredible, incredible that was win. Tremendous. And, and actually, that that was, if I'm not if I remember correctly, that was was that between Christmas and New Year that game? It was, it was actually. Uh, it was, wasn't it? Just before Christmas, yeah, we were yeah. went top of the league without winning that game. Yeah, was it was it two thousand and one that one? It's two thousand and one, and yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, because we because beat Arsenal and then we beat well, Leeds, didn't we? Well, yeah. because one of my other ones, and I'm going to just I'm going to jump ahead of you here, Paul. Um, mm. one of my other games on the list is one of my all time favourite Newcastle games ever, and that was winning three one at Arsenal because mm -hmm. that was uh, the reason I remember that is because. Um, 
my daughter had just been born in December 2001 and we played Arsenal. It was on the telly. We weren't there. We were watching it on the telly. We hadn't won in London for about 50 matches or something daft like that. And we went 1-0 down to Arsenal. So we were losing again. And then in the second half, we turned it round. And what I look, I just, it combined a couple of things that I love. First of all, it com- it had a, a last minute winner. But also the type of goal, like the, the the last goal, the third goal was a breakaway goal. Arsenal were pushing because we were 2-1 up at that point. Arsenal were Robert. pushing, they were trying to equalise. And then we broke away and Lauren Robert raced through Arsenal's oh. half and his finish into the bottom corner. I'll never forget, it was just amazing. And we were just cheering so loudly that... Obviously, my daughter, who'd just been born a couple of weeks or whatever before, she she was so shocked she started crying. Um, but that was just tremendous, and that we that sent us top of the league at that point, I think, as well. So yeah, yeah it was a happy yeah. time. That was a great game, wasn't that? She was first goal at um, at Highbury. Yeah, it was that's a penalty, correct. Yeah, a penalty. Was. yeah, the kick. penalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and we're the two goals. Goals. Yeah, the the because she was arguing saying it wasn't a red card. It's not a red card. Put your card away, ref. The referee was like, "No, I would have brandish it." But yeah. obviously, Robert. I mean, what what a talent! What a great player! Gets in Love into Robert. the you know running away foul for the penalty kick, mm-hmm. uh, and then obviously, like you said, mm-hmm. that breakaway goal. First time you win a spot kick. Next time you kill the game off. Absolutely uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff from uh, Lauren Robert. A lot Robert. of time for Lauren Robert. Yeah, Paul, give us give us one more from you. We've uh, had a couple, but I want to go back to just. Um, well, just a year ago, probably the, uh, the again, the Leicester game, Newcastle United 2, Leicester 1. They go ahead, um, I think, through Luckman. Jose Perez sets him up for the first goal. Now, it's a huge game. Obviously, we're battling. We're very much in a relegation mire, aren't we, at, at that point? Um, and then Bruno gets a brace. Now, Bruno really isn't known too much for goal scoring. That wasn't why he was brought to Newcastle United. Uh, but to score the goal right at the end, I remember... I'm right at the front, uh, St. James, right near pitch side, and I'm sitting there running up one arm. In, you know, and I, I, I've got the pictures still saved uh, of, of my celebration to that goal, to that situation. The noise again, uh, absolutely and utterly off the chat. The fact it was Bruno as well, a special player, a special moment uh, Yeah, from a special player was absolutely and utterly fantastic. Uh, but that was a massive, a massive his, thing. His in a arrival at got. the right moment. For the yeah, yeah. Just... I remember that game. Yeah, I mean, we, we, I think I voted that uh, because we had a goal of the season, didn't we? And I voted that goal as my favourite goal of last that season. Mm. And it, and I remember the ball going up to up to our fullback play position, and Matt Target was just holding the player off, and I'm I'm shouting, just hold it, hold it. But then he turns the Leicester player and then plays the ball down the line and then we were away. And that break, I mean, it was just incredible. And, of course, the way the ball set up for um, for Bruno to run onto him with his head in the top Willick? corner. Willick it was Willick. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, down the yeah. left, yeah. It was he's, just he's decent. Out. He's decent down the left hand side. The thing is, I don't think yes. people give him the credit for the speed he's got. Um, he's, and, again, he's got, he's got a good cross on him. He's not afraid to put the ball in. Uh, so I quite like him out on that wide left hand side position, like yeah. yeah big, big One of the other games I had picked was a Joe Willock winner against Chelsea last season. That that was yeah. when that was laid on, oh, and that yeah. was just... that goal. I think that's the one I picked for goal of the season. That one, I think it was did, yeah, because he literally took. Did he take it? He nicked it off the like like door or something. Mm-hmm. He, what yeah. a hit! Um, the 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 last one I had was um, just going back to the. In fact, a lot of mine come from the sort of. Same era, I'm looking at this. Um, the Bobby Robson era. Shearer, volley against Everton. Because Everton. obviously that we won, we were one nil down, we were struggling, and then Shearer hits his volley to make it one one. People never then talk about the fact we won the game. We actually went on to win the game. Shearer didn't score the winner. Bellamy scored the winner, I believe it was. Bellamy scored the um, winner. Yeah. Uh, with the last sort of minute, last back post yeah. tapping, didn't he? Uh to to win a game, two goals in the last five minutes basically to win a match uh, it was yeah. always going to have to take though in that particular game this was an Everton weren't absolutely crap they were decent back then they were <laughs> um, hard to play against yeah they were they definitely were hard. hard to play against and it was going to take one of those type of goals um, to, you know to sort of break break the duck as it were against mm-hmm. uh, that opposition but um, oh my word one of, one of the the 
best all time ever great goals. goals. Unbelievable. His favourite goal, I think, as well. Yeah. By yeah. his own admission. So. I think the thing that, is, Evan, that in the Evan goal. were always ugly and ugly tied to play, weren't they? Really always in, you know, they made it difficult to play. And it was a very frustrating afternoon until Shearer came up with that volley. I mean, it was just, and they took the net off, didn't it? Brilliant. It was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Well, that is a lot of fun re recapping uh, some of those. Can I just mention those. one more? Yeah. And it, it was just a series of them. Fulham. We and it came to mind when I was thinking about this, but then another match against Fulham came to mind the other day when I was talking to Lee, who was on last week, um, about his first game. And it was we played Fulham in 1983 84 promotion season, and we were 2 1 down going into um injury time, and uh, we scored twice, and it was bonfire night, and we won 3 2. So that was Fulham, and then in 2015, we played Fulham, and I don't know if you remember this, Paul, but. Papi Sisse scored in the last minute against Fulham to, and we won 1-0 and he went running off into the, the corner and jumped up Cracking into the crowd. Play, and that, that image uh, appears on a lot of... Um, uh, sort I know of, which one you mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. And then, of course, last season, we we get a late winner against Fulham again that was Isaac scoring because um, they frustrated us for 90-odd minutes and then we get a late winner. So that's yeah, three matches with Fulham. Just, uh, we, we've won a series of a series of beating Fulham late. Um, it mm. just reminded me, Isak, the the Forest game last season was another one, wasn't it? Where we oh where yeah, we, where we nicked it late. That away end, I wasn't there, but I don't know if you were there, Paul. Mm. Were you in the Forest away end? I wasn't that. No, I wasn't at that. Uh, uh, wasn't that, that, that game? Like, more people who were. That looked like but, a lot uh, of fun that away end that night. Oh yes, I, I was yeah. down. Uh, yeah. I was down a couple of seasons ago when we played them down there. Um, and we lost, and it was back in uh, Newcastle fans' TV days. And um, I was getting some pelters off the Forest fans as they were going past, but I was literally just venting. I'd I'd seen red, I'd <laughs> gone beyond it, and I was just they'd put the camera in front of us, and I was just like, right, blah 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 blah. And I think we had City the next game up. I'm like, oh, we need to park the bus. You know, it's 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 terrible, this uh, type thing. But uh, yeah, some uh, definite mm. memories from down at the City ground. It's a uh, one. It's if you, if nobody's ever been. Uh, and then you get a chance to go and see a Newcastle game down there. It's decent. It's decent. Yeah. Well, we did do that, didn't we? In the in the season yes. uh, that we, we just won the, the, <laughs> when we won the league. Yeah, we went there for the one one when Ian Warren broke my heart. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, and you, were, you, were, you were on Sky, Dad. I was on Sky, and I'm on the end of season video. If you ever look, and I'm I'm standing like this, praying for a goal. <laughs> the yeah. quarters. Martin um, Tyler references you doing this, but like. Anyway, I think we all do a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Right, let's wrap up then. Uh, little trip to Brighton at the weekend. So the uh, the game's coming thick and fast and uh, tricky match this one. Uh, how do you think Eddie Howe's going to approach this game? Does he make some changes? Does he stick with the starting eleven again? What do you reckon? What do you reckon, Paul? How do you think he's going to go with this one? I think if he was to... If you're one of the players who sat on the bench and you can understand it, if the team's playing well, they're getting the results, you have to remain patient and wait your turn until the manager says so. If the team hasn't got the results, that opens up opportunity for some of those players to knock on the manager's door and just say, I think I can do this or, you know. And I do mm -hmm. think there will be one or two changes. Hopefully Sven Botman... Uh, makes it there's some strong rumours that he's going to be okay for the weekend which is an absolute miracle from what I saw on the last game is that really? uh, but that would be a major, I'd, I'd would be a major that... boost oh, yeah. I've heard that think... he might miss a couple of games is that well, right? I, I, heard, I heard that originally but then I think it was Mark Douglas I put it up on the socials uh, today for Magpie 24-7 right. uh, saying that there, there is a chance that he could be fit for this game if there's even a slight doubt Eddie Howe on the side of caution will keep him back there's no doubt about it but if he is to be fit that would be a massive uh, positive uh, as far as I'm concerned but I do think he'll make one or two other changes I think Jacob Murphy's been very unfortunate only getting a, literally a few dregs of minutes uh, Callum Wilson hasn't really had much opportunity you've got to think that we're probably not going to have a great amount of the ball so do you have somebody who you can just hit those Fabian Chair longer balls and who is going to be able to uh, keep the ball up the top perhaps maybe make a change like that but I think Anthony Gordon's done enough. Um, the midfielders have probably uh, done enough. As long as there's no major injuries and stuff like that, I think there'll be one or two. I think 
you, you could make arguments for like a Jacob Murphy. I think Callum, um, you know, Callum Wilson definitely uh, will be wanting some minutes. He said, look, I've waited patiently. He's had his opportunity. It didn't work out last time. Can I have some minutes? Um, so I can perhaps maybe see a change there. But I don't see loads of changes, if I'm being honest. Yeah, fair enough. What do you reckon, Gordon? Yeah, I, I agree with Callum Wilson. I think it'll start with Callum Wilson on Saturday. I think um, not that Isaac well, I, it did anything wrong on Sunday, but I, I just think it was a tough game. Um, and I just yeah. think he'll bring the changes. And I think what you say about... Brighton are a you know a team where you know they, they will have a lot of the ball as well. You know they, they will counteract us a lot uh, the way they play. Um, the thing about Brighton but, that I think we could get at is they do concede a few goals, so I think there's there is the opportunity there for us if we're on it, if our finishing's good, I think yeah. that we can we can take it to them and and outscore them. I do expect there to be some goals in this game. Yeah, our defense definitely. isn't as solid yeah. as we'd like it to be either. So. And, and Brighton obviously yeah. have a threat in attack. They've got plenty of goals. We, we need we need season. to keep it some clean sheets as well. I think that's a really, really important point to, to make because coming from the end of last season, now I understand um, that you know Nick Pope was probably playing with one and a half hands for a lot of the games because of the yeah. injury that he had. Uh, but we've not we've sort of lost the art of keeping clean sheets. So I would very much like it if we could keep a clean sheet because I always mm-hmm. fancy us to at least nick one at the other end. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we need. Well, that we need was the thing, wasn't it? Last last season, uh, well, pretty much since Howe's come in, since since last like January last year, our defensive record was great for a long time, wasn't it? It was kind of like mm. a team. We're like two quarters of gloss. You know what yeah. I mean? We were that. A, a team would have to score two goals if they wanted a, a, anything from us, basically. But that isn't quite the case now. We we seem to we do we have conceded a few more goals than we'd probably like. So it would be nice to just get back to just being a bit more solid at the back, I think. But yeah. we'll I mean, we've got, we've got great a bit, defenders. It's a little bit of draw right. down there this time last year, wasn't it? Yeah. And the thing is, you know, if we do get a nil-nil, and it's worth pointing that out, if you look at last season's results, I know a lot of people are panicking and you shouldn't really look at the league table until probably 10 games has gone. But we are matching last season's results so far. If you look at last season where we finished fourth, this season, we're getting the exact same results as we got last season. So, again, yeah. no need to panic. Everybody needs just to keep taking deep breaths. You know, if it is a draw or something tomorrow, then it's a draw and we move on. There are some very, very, um, on paper, shall we say, decent fixtures coming up. Yeah. Uh, but I still fancy us to go down there and I'll always back Newcastle United to get the victory. Good. Yeah. I think, I think it's important we don't lose this game. Yeah. Because yeah, of the international and the fact that if we lose it, it'll be three defeats in a row. Um, and going into an international break, I don't think that is necessarily a very good thing. Um, so I, I think we need to be not losing the game, but I do expect that we will give it a go and, and try to win it because that's yeah. that's generally the way we play, isn't it? Yeah, oh, we'll be going there to win, no doubt. Yeah, I totally agree, and I think. Brighton are going to be a tough team, no doubt about it. We don't have the best record down there, as we've mentioned in this this show. But funny enough, there there's a best moment to there. Well, yeah, you know, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> Records are there to be broken, aren't they? At the end of the yeah. day, we'll see. Let's see what happens because after the international break, lots of fixtures come in in all sorts of competitions. So if we can get a positive result, we'll all be happy. But uh, yeah, good one. Anyway. Thank you so much for this evening to both of you. Um, if you don't, I'm sure all of you do anyway. They've got millions of followers on Magpie 24-7. But if you don't follow Magpie 24-7, go and follow Paul and Kyle over at Magpie 24-7 on Twitter and everything else that you do. I know you're all <laughs> over the place, aren't you? Yeah, we um, are. We are everywhere. Um, but always always good stuff over there. So, so go and check them out. And yeah, enjoy the weekend. And fingers crossed for a result against Brighton. Great definitely stuff. very good thank you okay right thanks so much thanks so much for listening to view from the gallagher uh, we'll be back in a week's time with more newcastle united content so check us out check us out then and you can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts